morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Is everybody ready to worship the Lord? Come on, I can't hear you. Is everybody ready to worship the Lord? Hallelujah. To our God and heaven's King, your mighty name, Lord, we cry like a banner lifted high, for you are great and greatly to be praised. Come on. around your throne, in your presence is my home. 
God. We praise you, Lord. Father God, we praise you anywhere. We praise you with our mouth. We praise you with our hands. We praise you in dance, Lord God. We just worship you this morning.
unto you the slain and risen King. We lift our voice with heaven, singing worthy, Lord of all. Come on, sing that. So be enthroned upon the praise. Come on, lift him up. He said, Where the praises of his people are, is where he will take residence in space. Lift up your praise, give him a place. surrender to you, O oh Father. We give you the highest praises. You deserve the highest praises. We give all attention to you, O oh God, in this moment. Be enthroned, O oh Lord. Be enthroned, O oh Lord. You know, I say at work a lot, you just have to fake it till you make it. There's no faking it in the kingdom of God, but can I tell you what there is? When I don't feel like it, when my situation doesn't look like I should be praising, that's when I need to sing the highest praise. Paul and Silas had no reason to be praising God the way they were. This morning, church, whether this is the first time you're in this building or the thousandth time you're watching online, I think we need to raise our voices. There's a time for silence, but that time is not today. God needs to hear your voice, your praise, not because you feel like it, not because I'm happy or I feel like, oh, I have joy, but because the joy of the Lord is my strength, because I'm gonna believe in his promises. I'm gonna live like I actually have an everlasting king that's on my side. So right now, I need you to lift your voice at home. Get off your couch, pull over your car, lift your voice right now. And I think our God needs to hear our highest praises with a little bit of drums this morning. God needs to hear your praise. What is it that you need to say to him this morning? What is your high praise sound like, church? Let's go. Let's go.
God, may our may your praise always be on our lips. In the valley and on the mountain, God. May the joy of the Lord be our strength. May we live like you are really walking with us. You have our back. You go before us, God. May we walk like a victorious people. And God, may the praise of our King always be on our lips. Together, church, can we say amen? At home, can you say amen? Amen. Listen, before you sit down, give someone next to you a squeeze. Let them know you're glad they're here. If you're watching online, we're so glad you chose to be with us this morning. We believe you're a part of the Kingdom Life family wherever you are. And listen, if this is your first time, welcome. My name's Lauren Palumbo. I'm one of the pastors here. It's such an honor to be part of the leadership team of this house. I hope you get a chance to meet a bunch of us today. You can text guests to the number on the screen. We would actually love to meet you after service as well. Pastor Marco, my husband, and I will be up front. And then we have a whole team in the foyer ready to greet you. We have a little gift for you too. But we'd love to connect with you. Well, listen, it is Baby Dedication Sunday. So welcome to all the families that are here. So Baby Dedication, we do this twice. We do this a couple times a year. We're doing it now. And then we're going to do it again in the fall. And the Palumbos will likely be dedicating baby number three in the fall. <laughs> All right, that's as much as you're getting about that. We're moving on, but I can't hide it anymore, so I had to let you in. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but we love baby dedication, and this is just something so special that we do as a family. So we believe a couple things. One, as parents, you know, it's so nice to dress your baby up and make them look, or your toddler, you know, make them look so beautiful, go out to brunch afterwards, and that's so wonderful. But this is so much more than that. And can I tell you, it's so much more for the whole family because you as parent, parents, as guardians, as those that are caring for and loving those little ones, this starts with you dedicating yourselves. And then you bring your baby into the kingdom of, of, of God. You then are making a declaration to dedicate your child because quite frankly, our I know this is hard to, to swallow, especially as you're holding like a newborn, but our kids are not our own. They really are a gift from heaven, one that it's our responsibility to steer and to guide, but they are first and foremost the Lord. So we love this day, and then we love for all of us really to celebrate the family together, the growing family. Amen? All right, so let me tell you who we're dedicating today. And as I call your name, please, um, families, come on up. Bring your little one, and um, we'll, we'll dive right in. Camila Elisa Proano. You can clap. <laughs> Mila Romana Torres. Luca Asher Moreno Ramos. Alex Manuel Vidal Vasquez. Adeline Celeste Rafalco. Austin Alexander Avena and Paul Anthony Avena. Jackson Kenneth D. John Van Carlo. Camilla Grace Moreno. Look at these beautiful families. Can we give it up for them one more time as they're finding their place up here? It's such an honor to have you all with us this morning. We're so thrilled that you're here. And let me just tell you, if your babies start acting up, it's totally fine. Don't worry about a thing. 
So as I was thinking about you all and thinking about today, what it means for you and what you're experiencing in this season, can I tell you one thing for sure is that each and every one of you are going to make mistakes, okay? So just get ready. The, there is no perfection in parenting, but you know what else I've, I thought about for all of you? I imagine some of you are reading a ton of books and like trying to get all the information. Continue doing that. Information is so important. But there is nothing like the leading and the guidance from the Holy Spirit through the word of God, through prayer, because each and every one of your children are completely different. And what one is going to need, another is not going to. So parents, guardians, don't second guess your leadings. Don't second guess what God is saying to you. That's where you need to lean in. And sometimes you need to quiet the noise. I'm sorry, but even of the families, because sometimes it's... It's just the Holy Spirit that we need to lean on, especially mamas, because I know we take on a whole whole different sense in those like crazy midnight hours, and you're you're wondering how you're going to get through. The answer is the Holy Spirit, and the other answer is. We don't, success is not going it alone. When you need to ask for help, that's not failure, that's not weakness. You need to ask for help. There's a whole village of people here and I'm sure around you, so don't hesitate, okay? Okay. I'm gonna read what we call a parent's promise and when I'm done, I would love you to say, I agree. I vow to look to God for his guidance to lead me in the decisions I make as a parent, aware that from this moment on, anything I do and everything I am will influence my child's life. I vow to teach my child how to love God through my words and by my example, to teach his word and his ways to show that he is their source and I am an extension of his love. I vow to pray for and cover my child diligently. I will study and train to be the best parent possible, recognizing that this is a sacred trust. I vow to honor my child as God's first, acknowledging always that they are valuable and precious to him and to me. Do you agree? Amen. Pastor Marco is going to come up and speak a blessing over these families. Good morning, families. You look so beautiful. If I can just add, many of you, this isn't your first child for some of you. This is your first. Congratulations. And there's no greater joy, and there's no greater sacrifice. And I don't say that lightly than raising up God's greatest gift, a child, a son, a daughter, and to raise them up in the way that they should go. That's what the word tells us. And we know from experience, through mistakes, through humility, through God's word, that the only way we can dedicate a child in good faith the only way we could honestly stand here and say, God, I dedicate this child to you, is to say, I also dedicate myself. Whether we did that 20 years ago, what I know is every time I even come close to thinking about how to raise up my two sons and Lauren and I pray, it always starts with God. We need you. We dedicate ourselves to you. We cannot do this on our own. So as you dedicate your child, knowing God today is also looking for your heart and for your devotion and dedication to him, no matter what. Amen? Amen. Amen. Church, if you don't mind standing up, if you feel comfortable, extend your hands. We're going to pray over you. And then Pastor Lauren and I are going to come down and we're going to anoint each one of your children this morning. So Lord God, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. I thank you for every single child here. 
and their parents, their grandparents, their aunts, their uncles, those that are standing with them, those that are here gathering with them, those that are going to be instrumental in raising them up and partnering with them throughout the years, Lord God. We pray a blessing over their lives because we know you created them. You knit them together in their mother's womb. You set them apart. You know the hairs on their head. You have called them. You have a purpose and a calling. You are their Lord, their God, their Father. And we thank you. And I pray for the grace and the wisdom and the love for each mother and father and others as they stand here today as they continue to dedicate their lives to you, may you guide them in their own lives and how to raise up this child in you. We thank you, Lord God.
God, we thank you for these precious children and the families that stand here today. We ask that you continue to be the center, the bedrock, the foundation of every single home. And may your spirit continue to protect, to lead, to guide, be the advocate, be the wisdom, the discernment, the understanding. Give them insight. And Lord God, we pray that it is all bound by your love, love for one another, and love for you that faces all and every storm. We thank you so much. And we praise you for the days ahead. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Turn around. Let the church see you. Take a step back. Give it up for all these beautiful kids. Oh, we're taking a picture with the families. We're taking, all right, step all the way back. We're going to come in the middle of all of you. I don't know who or how they're taking this picture, but we'll stand here for 10 seconds. All right, give it up for him one last time. You may be seated. Amen. As the families are making their way back to our seats, at this time, children, you are excused to Kids Church. You may exit the sanctuary, and let's just put our hands together for all the kids in the house heading down to Kingdom Kids. At this time, I have a few announcements for you, and then we're going to go into our time of giving. Amen? There is so much stuff going on this weekend. It's going to be a great weekend, something for everyone. So we really want to encourage you to come out. Um, this Friday night, April 19th at 7 p.m., we have a ladies' night here at the cathedral. We are so excited to start our next um, three-month series, so we invite you, all you ladies, out to come join us. Then Saturday morning at 8 a.m., the men are having a men's breakfast downstairs in the fellowship court, so men, you guys are invited to come out. And lastly, Saturday night, there is a young adult event at 7 p.m. at the youth center right down the street. So there's literally something for everyone. We encourage you guys to come out, join us, and while you're at it, Sign up, or not sign up, download the app. The app is the best way to get announcements. It'll give you push notifications if you want it to remind you, hey, this is coming up. It's a great way to stay connected. Amen. And lastly, membership classes. The next membership class will be on Saturday, April 27th. You can sign up with the QR code right on the screen, or you can do it on the app that I just mentioned, or go right online. If you've been maybe visiting for a while and you feel like this is going to be your home, we invite you to come out and just take those membership classes and really make it official that you are part of this community. Amen? All right, time for giving. Are you guys ready to give? I love this part of service. I, I genuinely mean that. And I just want to let you know, if you're new here, there's a few ways to give. You can text GIVE to the number 475-255-7744. You can give right on the app or on the website. Or lastly, in a moment, there will be ushers around with offering envelopes, and you're more than welcome to fill one out and drop one in the offering bucket. So for giving, I... If, only, if the only reason I gave was every reason that the Bible tells me I should, that is surely enough. Amen? Scripture is clear about giving. But this morning, I just want to share with you a personal conviction that I have about giving. I remember, I don't even know, like 16, 17 years ago now, the day that I got saved. I remember where I stood at that altar. I remember it like I remember that moment when my life was changed forever on probably one of the worst weekends that I had ever experienced. And when I thought, think about that moment, and I don't know if it's the, like the administration in me or like the operations mindset, but I remember after being saved, just like being very aware that so much went into that moment. Yes, I was saved by Jesus. Let's not get it confused. 
But I knew that someone had given, someone had sacrificed to make room for me. There was someone that was there before me that had been sowing, that had been giving, that had been praying so that I could stand at that altar that Sunday morning. And I remember the first time I walked into this beautiful sanctuary, I remember where I sat with my husband and my family. And when I give, I think about that. I think about making room for other people to experience Jesus. And it's not just about that moment of salvation, but I think about even a baby dedication, even the transitions that my husband and I have been through over the last 16 years. Giving makes room for people to do that in community, in the fellowship of other believers. And when I give, I think, God, I wanna make room for someone. I want to make space. I want someone else to come and sit in my sacrifice. I want to know that I made a difference for your kingdom. So right now, as we prepare to give, I just want you to keep that in mind. When you give, it's not just, it's not just about being obedient, which is very important. It's also about the space you make for other people, the space you make for the next generation, the space you make for the people that you're even praying for right now that they may know Jesus, you're making room for them to come into this place, to encounter a living God, and to get connected with a body of believers that are gonna help them in their path, amen? So let's prepare to give at this time. Let's, um, if you don't mind, let's stand, let's pray. The ushers will come around with baskets in a moment, but let's just pray and believe that every time we give, we are making room for God to move. We are making room for those who are far from the Lord to be close to him, amen? God, we believe that right now as we give, we are making room. We are making room for our families, for our friends, for our loved ones who may be lost but shall be found in Jesus' name. We believe that we are making room, God, for you to move. It's not by our works, Lord, but we love that we can partner, that we can give, that we can do our part, God, so that you, Lord, can do so much more. In this moment, God, I I pray, God, that you would bless those who are with something to give and bless those who are not that you would be with us, God, that you would lead us, Lord, and that we would know that we would have a conviction that our gift makes a difference, our tithe makes a difference, that we, as a church, make room for others every time we give. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Ushers, you may serve the people. Alrighty, church, we're not done praising. Y'all got some more praise in you? Come on, stand on up with me. Come on, give me some claps. We're going to declare so much this morning. All right, I know y'all know this song. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Come on, sing, I believe. I believe in signs and wonders. And you have resurrection power. Still the miracle. Registered in heaven, my praise, my praise belongs to you forever. Sing this is this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Spirit, Son, and Father, 
morning from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. church don't sit down stand on up for the word of the Lord this morning as we read the word I want to welcome all the visitors here good morning for the families that were dedicated thank you for coming this morning it's great to see all of you but as is our custom here stand on up for the reading of God's word this morning Acts chapter 2 Verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Good morning, church. My name is Pastor Marco. It is an honor to bring the word to you this morning. We are talking about discipleship. And we're specifically talking about transformative discipleship. And today I want to talk about the beginning of this process and how it's so important to be rooted. To be rooted in where you want to grow. To have deep roots so you can bear fruit, so you can bloom, so you can withstand the storms of life, so you have something to draw out of. But I'll get into all that in a moment. So we see here in this incredible passage the beginning of the church. The church in Jesus Christ. Christianity as we call it today. We see the beginning right here. What happens? What transforms scared, weak, frightened, fearful disciples that when Jesus got arrested, they scattered and ran. As the one that Jesus said, you will be called the rock, Peter, that I will build my church on, the one that denied three times and denied it not to an army but denied it to a couple of people. They say one was even probably a little girl that he denied and ran from. They doubted. They hid. How do we suddenly go from those type of people to ones that stand boldly proclaiming Jesus. If you know the history of the church, we know that all the disciples and many more were persecuted because of their faith in Jesus. Many of them were put to death because of their faith in Jesus. Peter even was like, no, you cannot hang me on a cross like Jesus. I cannot I am not worthy to die the same way he did. 
hang me upside down. And he actually died hung upside down. So how does a man have this boldness, this conviction? How does this church start? Well, we read in chapter 2 of the book of Acts that they gather together in one room, the upper room. You may have known the story. You may have heard it before. They gather together for 10 days. They close the doors and they pray. And they don't just pray random prayers. They don't just pray for safety and for favor. They don't just pray that they will be able to do a good job. They don't pray that they'll be successful in life. Those aren't necessarily the prayers. We don't know all of the prayers they prayed. It was 10 days. We know the heart of what they prayed. And the purpose of what they prayed for. And they prayed for the very thing Jesus promised them before he went to the cross. Jesus promised them the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm going to leave you, but fear not. I'm going to send you an advocate, a helper, a counselor, a friend. The Holy Spirit that will live in you and with you. And that will be with you forever. And he will bring, I'm paraphrasing here, you can read this in John 14. He will bring all things that I have taught you to remembrance. I'm going to send the very Spirit of God to live in you. Wow. Wow. And we know through the history of the church, through the writings of Paul and Peter in the New Testament, through the accounts of the book of Acts, which follows the apostles and what they did, we know that this Holy Spirit is for us today. We know that this gift that we can pray Holy Spirit, come, and the Holy Spirit can fill us. Is there anybody here that can testify to that by just raising your hand of being filled with the Holy Spirit throughout this place? Come on, don't be shy if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at this. That's what I'm talking about. It is real. That's right. So now, we see through this transformative moment that suddenly the church is birthed. The body of Christ is birthed. What we call Sunday morning. What we call Christianity. And what happens is ext extraordinary. At the end of chapter 2, these five scriptures I just read they're not necessarily what happens in this chronological order. It is a statement at the end of this chapter as the church starts that tells us what actually happens in the chapters coming ahead. What happens in chapter 3 and chapter 4? What happens when they get arrested? What happens when the Pharisees push up against them? What happens when persecution comes? What happens when they step out of Jerusalem and Galilee and, Galilee and go out and start building the church? We see this. It is not necessarily a formula that we go by line by line, but in it has the heart and the principles of what it means to be the church today. And with that, there are, main, there are two main things that stand out to me amongst a lot of other things that I want to share with you today. First, is we see devoted leadership. Before we get to those that gave their lives to the Lord, those that responded to the gospel to follow Jesus Christ, and they devoted themselves, the Bible says. Before that happens, we actually see the leadership devoting themselves. Because before 
people can respond to the gospel. Before we could even try to gather in a church. Before we could actually be the church. God starts with the leadership. God starts with the disciples. Jesus says, no, no, with you, Peter, I'm going to build my church. With you, disciples, you're going to do greater things than I did. Through you, I'm going to build my church. And what they do They first are filled and led by Christ Jesus. This is important to understand. It's almost like, yeah, that's a no-brainer. But some of us may have experiences, whether by afar, whether personal experiences growing up in the church, or just reading the hottest scandal that comes across our feeds, whether it's cable news, whether it's Instagram or TikTok or whatever it might be, we see and hear of people falling short, leadership falling short of these things. And we're not here to condemn, judge. We realize this is a reality. I don't have the time. We can go even into the letters that Paul wrote that addresses false prophets and false teachers, those that are misguided and those that you should be wary of. But the heart and what God has ordained is his church. In Ephesians 4, God gives us the five-fold ministry. We might talk about that in the days to come. But with this, God sets apart his leadership. And he says the requirement for this leadership is that you seek me. That you are filled with my spirit. That you have my character. And that you are an example of me. That's why Paul says with such boldness and confidence as he's writing a letter, he says, follow my example as I follow Christ. Realizing, man, you do not want to follow Marco. That's hit or miss. That's hit or miss. What you want to follow is the Marco that died to himself and is alive in Christ, that is now doing his best to understand the scriptures to be approved by the Lord, by knowing the word, by studying and showing myself approved. I love in Acts 4, when you see Paul, I mean Peter and John teaching, and they heal a man, and then they're talking to the people and the Pharisees are there and the Sadducees are there. They end up arresting them. That's a long story. But they end up saying they took note that these were men that had been with Jesus. They took note that these were unschooled, uneducated men that had been with Jesus. Not because they're, oh yeah, I think I remember them walking together. No, they took note by the words they spoke, by the authority and power in which they operated and walked in. They were the example. They walked out. And this is what we need to be as leadership. Whether we're the leader of the home, as parents, as mothers and fathers dedicating your child, it's in the same way of saying, no, I'm going to raise this child. It's not about my ways or just my experiences or what I think or the prism that I see the world in and how to address what's going on around me. No, I need the word of God. I need the presence of God. I need his spirit to fill me and to lead me. Many of you that have two or three children, you know it's not the same way. It's not cookie-cutter parenting. 
You know what worked with one child. You try to do it to the next and you'll strike out every time. Because it's not a, just a list of rules and do's and don'ts. It's about discernment and understanding. It's about leading of the Holy Spirit. And that's the same way with the church. That's the same way with pastors and leaders. The fivefold ministry. To walk humbly. But to know the authority and the power you have when you spend time with Jesus. See, we know this because the apostles are now fully transformed. They are filled with boldness, authority, passion, empathy. They have vision, humility, power, and love. As we read the book of Acts, we are amazed by these men and how they are living their life. What they have been transformed and these women been transformed into from where they came. And realizing God is not a respecter of persons. What he did for them, the Bible says he'll do for us. What he's done for me, he'll do for you. What he's done for you, he'll do to the person next to you. Regardless of whether you think that person is worthy or not. God says, come. And we are not justified through Christ Jesus because of our works. Because of what we do. We are not justified because we get it all right. We are justified, the word says, by grace and grace alone. We are justified by the work of the cross, what Jesus did on that cross and when he conquered death. That is how I'm justified. So I don't come to Jesus boldly because I've been good this week. I come to Jesus boldly because of the cross. And we're all invited into. So we see this with the apostles. And this is the desire of the leadership of this house that we can speak about. Can't speak about the church down the street or the church that's making the tabloids. In this house, from the beginning, from when Bishop and Janine started this 33 years ago almost, in a month or so. Crazy. It was built on integrity, humility, character, on the principles of God, on the word, on prayer. So we walk humbly. This is the type. We want to be imitators of Jesus' character. Not just imitators of his power. And realizing when we have his character, when we have his integrity, the power comes. So, how did the apostles do this? The strategy of God to bring forth his church was not for the 12 disciples and the others. There was 120 in that upper room. It wasn't for them to go back into their homes, to go back into their prayer closets, and to get the Holy Spirit on their own. What does it say in Acts? Right, what is it, in Acts 1? Acts 2, let me... Acts 2, 1. When the day of Pentecost came, when the Holy Spirit finally came, when God's plan of redemption that would manifest onto earth through his church, when it finally came after thousands of years of him patiently dealing with humanity, dealing with our sin, and dealing with our just misses more than hits, what is... God say, they were all together in one place. We want to skip by that. We want to get to suddenly the Holy Spirit fell. No, they were all together in one place. God's strategy for kingdom life 
is that we will become all together in one place. We will be the church. We will be the hope. We will be a demonstration of his love and authority if we come together. That's why, as you read Acts, and I keep on saying this over and over again, because you need to read it. As you read the book of Acts, you see they gathered, they gathered, they gathered and prayed, they gathered and prayed, they gathered and the Holy Spirit came. It wasn't just here. After Peter and John were released from prison the first time, right? In chapter four, it says they went back and what did they do? They prayed. And what happened when they prayed? The Holy Spirit fell. But didn't the Holy Spirit just fall? Guess what the Holy Spirit has a habit of doing? Showing up when we come together. When we come together. This is what it's about. So now, the other thing that we see, a devoted leadership, we see a devoted church. Not a wishy-washy church. We see a devoted church. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Not generic. Not just some generic teaching. Not just picking and choosing. They devoted to the apostles' teaching. These community-driven teachings. I dare you to reread the New Testament writings. Reread the books with the perception, with the perspective, I mean, of unity, of coming together. You'll realize that most of the scriptures we declare over ourselves and speak over ourselves and we pray by ourselves was never meant for by ourselves. It was always meant together. Coming together. It is not a coincidence that as we see the church being built for the first time, it says 3,000 people give their lives to the Lord. They accept salvation. What, it's, what they say, that we're saved. They accept salvation. They make a commitment, which simply means to follow Jesus Christ. To follow him. They believe in him. They believe he is the way, the truth, and the life. And what it means is now that they're part of the church. They're part of a community. And what this community looks like, it says they immediately start building in these foundational things that are alive today, that are meant for the church today, the apostles' teaching. They devoted not to a generic, you know, Instagram, TikTok message that now you go back to your church and challenge like, hey, I heard this been said. What's up with that? Why do we do this and not that? Man, if anything, if you're going to do that, at least then go study it. Go get into the word. Go listen to the teachings we've taught on that subject. Put it all together. Be diligent. Be thought-provoking. Then go to one of your leaders and say, hey, I heard somebody say this. I did my due research. I studied. I meditated on this. And I'm still a little bit conflicted and confused. Let's talk. Can, can we talk about it? We'll talk about that all day long. Don't just give that random shot. So then it says fellowship with one another. They fellowshiped. They became a beautiful, diverse community. What does that mean? Fellowship doesn't mean they went to church on Sunday. That isn't it. I know for a lot of us, that is where we are, and that's okay. All of them were part of the crowd. They were part of a crowd. They were doing their religious thing. They were in Jerusalem, right? They were there for the festival. They were there to do their religious thing, which isn't bad. But then, 
as they were moving with the crowd, they heard the truth revealed from Peter about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Messiah. And they moved from the crowd to being a follower. And when they became a follower, it says they fellowshiped. They did life together. They talked about the word together. They ministered to each other together. They encouraged one another together. They took care of each other's needs together. Not just financially, emotionally, spiritually. They were there for one another. That's the power. That's where the hidden sauce is with the church. That's where the, you find the power when we come together. Fellowship isn't just going downstairs into a hall or after service talking. That's part of it. But there's a deeper, deeper well to draw into that God is calling us into that we are encouraging you to be a part of. That's why right now I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about some things that are happening over this next month here at Kingdom Life. And this is important. Because devoting yourself to the apostles' teaching isn't just devoting yourself to a teaching you hear on YouTube that's amazing from some pastor or even listening to a message from a couple weeks ago that Pastor Mike brought, which was incredible. What it means is apostolic leadership should be in the house. Leading of how we as a church are going to move that's why being rooted in the church matters. That means you belong into this soil. You get fed in this soil. It could rain in Oklahoma, but that's not affecting it here. We glean and learn from the full body. Absolutely. I encourage you to listen to many different voices, but we are devoted to the apostles' teaching and the leading as God's leading this house in the direction we are going. That's why when we talk about prayer rooms, we're not just putting out a suggestion, hey, you know, it's a cool little thing we want. We don't want to do more stuff. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> Every leader I talk to, they're, they're, they're managing. They're trying to multitask, right? They're compromising. They're sacrificing. But when God speaks, we're going to do this. So what are some of the other things? You've heard it. If you've been in this house, if this is your first time, we have this discipleship program called Alpha. Give it up. It is starting this week. If you have never been part of Alpha, if you have never done it, I implore you. Hit up that QR code on the screen. There might be a space or two for online classes, but most of them are going to be right in this building on Wednesday night, starting this Wednesday, for 11, 12 weeks. This Alpha course gets us to sit down and ask the real hard questions Who is God? Who is Jesus? Is he real? If he is, what difference does that make in my life? What is church? Am I supposed to be part of a community? Is Sunday mornings enough? If not, what else can I do? How do I balance this? Is there a Holy Spirit? Is what Pastor Marco just said, is what Jesus promised, is that actually real? And if so, can the Holy Spirit of God live in me? These are the questions we tackle, we wrestle with, we discuss. And this is the place we're inviting you to start your discipleship journey. This is the place where if you've already done it, we are asking you to bring others into. The other thing we're starting in a couple of weeks is our life groups. And our life groups 
meet all different days of the week. Some meet in person, some meet online. Some meet on Mondays, some meet on Fridays, some meet on Saturdays, some meet on Tuesdays, all different days of the week. And we come together and we do it. When you sign up, you can be part of a trimester of them. We do them for like 10, 12 weeks, three times a year. And you begin to build community. And we talk about the Bible together. But more important than that, we don't just talk about the Bible. They begin to do life. They begin to do what happens here in Acts 2, where they break bread together. They have meals with one another. They fellowship. And they support one another. When they're sick, they take care of them. When they need a ride to go to the doctors, they'll go and pick, up, pick them up and bring them to the doctors. I mean, they do amazing things with each other as they realize it's not just about going to church. It's not about just punching the clock. It's about being rooted. It's about belonging. What I love about a garden is that most gardens are so diverse. They have all different flowers that thrive together. They grow together. They get deep roots together, and they belong there. We want to encourage you. Sign up for a life group. Make it a priority. And here's the thing. If it's at the beginning, if it's like, oh, and you feel like it's work, if you feel like it's hassle, that's understandable. But if you feel that way four weeks in, stop doing it. Okay? Because we believe that church shouldn't just be things that we just have to do. Oh, I got to get up and go to church this morning. Oh, I have to do this. Oh, I got to go to prayer. No, if that's the way we feel, pause. Close the door. Start praying. Open up the Bible. Seek your heart. Connected with him. Connect with Jesus. Because what it should be is a vibrant life together. On today, as I hang out with my family, as we have our Sunday meal, and we talk and we enjoy one another, I don't see it as work. I don't know if you see your family gatherings or the times you gather with your friends together as work. If you do, then it's a calling. You're trying to lead them to the Lord or something's really, really, really wrong. It's a joy. It's part of my life. It's what I do. What do you mean I don't want to spend time with my wife and my, and my children? That's what, that's what Acts 2 is saying. What they got into a rhythm of. The culture they built, what the church looked like, why it exploded, why not only did 3,000 come and devote and commit themselves to this type of rhythm and culture in church, but it says every single day. And for the record, they didn't have church buildings that they opened up every single day. They didn't even own a temple. There wasn't a synagogue where the Christian church went to. They were just gathering every day. They were in the streets. They were in the homes. They were at the workplace. They were about the Father's business. And it's because it was alive and bursting within them. Because they got rooted and planted into something that was bigger than themselves. First to the Lord Jesus and then with one another. They began breaking bread. And when they began to break bread they began to be family. I don't have much time to develop this, but if you know that culture, the most sacred thing was to have people at your dinner table. What it meant was you and I are one. You and I are brothers. You and I are family. That's, what, that's why... 
the Pharisees got so indignant with Jesus and the disciples when Jesus had the nerve of going and eating dinner and sitting at the table of the tax collectors. Like, how dare you? Those tax collectors are vile. Don't you know what they did to the Jewish people? Don't you know what they're doing to us? Don't you know that they turned their back on us? And you're going to eat with them? You're going to call them brothers? She's like, yes. Powerful. And then prayer. They built a culture of prayer. In this prayer, it is multifaceted. There is my personal prayer life, which is needed, which I need to develop. The same way when I go to the gym and build up my, there is a personal devotion. There is a one-on-one -on -one prayer life. There is a one-on-one -on -one meditation that is needed. You can't just come together. We need both. And when it comes to prayer, we do need that one-on-one. -on -one. But what they're talking about here is they had this discipline of praying together. They had this rhythm, this lifestyle of knowing it's time to pray. Let's pray. Let's gather. Let's pray. That's why tomorrow night for the prayer room at 730, those that do it, they keep on coming back. They keep on coming back. They keep on coming back. It isn't because they have nothing else to do. Sometimes they're coming with their, with their scrubs still on from the, from the office. You know, they got their work outfits on. They don't even go home. Like, yeah, I haven't eaten dinner yet. Why? Because I need this more than I need that food. Food's waiting for me. It's a whole nother thing. And this prayer is what we need to start doing together. Praying with one another. The power of it. They built... A culture and a rhythm of being a church community with ebbs and flows of the world and the society they lived in. Are we going to do such a thing? Do we think of such a way? How does the church thrive in Milford, Connecticut? How do we equip? How do we become followers? How are we become disciples? How are we the big church? How do we be, build this? See, another thing we're doing, you can put this up on the screen. In, I believe the date will come up. We're doing an evangelism course. See, our Wednesday nights, what's the date? Somebody tell me. May 8th. So starting in May, we're going to do an eight-week course on evangelism. I was a little, I was messing around, not messing around, but I was a little flipping last week talking about evangelism and how we're not just, you know, preaching from a rooftop for, you know, to strangers, but how we are investing and how God is calling us where we live. You might have heard the term, the streets that we occupy, where you work, where you go to school. Where you gather, where other people are. It could be your gym, your workplace, your studio. It could be your neighborhood. It could be the park where my son's swinging and there's other people that I see all the time. And now he's stepping out and actually caring and investing. How do we evangelize to the point where we invite them into a community and share our faith in a way that's real and tangible, that makes a difference and doesn't just turn off. It's not argumentative. It's not a debate. We're calling you. Show up. Register today, starting on Wednesday nights, May 8th, for eight weeks. This evangelism course is going to be amazing. And it, we run it the same way we ran the prayer course a couple months ago, same way we run Alpha we do videos, we do in small groups, then we discuss in small groups and talk, and it gets real. Let me close with this scripture. Psalm 92, verse 11. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. 
They will steer, still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming, The Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Will we be rooted in God? Do you know when we talked about membership happening in a couple weeks, that's not just a suggestion. It is a suggestion that the sense that you can do it, not do it, we're not going to follow up on you. But we believe that we should be rooted in the body of Christ, in a church that God calls us to. I believe that God called me to kingdom life. I remember telling Bishop a couple times, Bishop, I, I'm a pastor at Kingdom Life. God might have different plans, but my heart, my desire, <laughs> that I'm a pastor here. God called me here. I can't even imagine outside of these walls. God has it, but because I'm planted here. My roots are here. My sons this is home to them. They walk around here, not because they have this lofty, you know, thing that, and I'm like, you own this place. No, that's, they walk around here like they own it because this place, they walk around this place like they walk around their house. It's where they belong. It's where they're growing up. It's where their family and friends are. They already have deep roots. I can't imagine trying to pull up my four-year-old out of this place and going somewhere else. Man, and a lot of you have had to do that with your children. And you know what I'm talking about. But God, some of you need to pray, God, is this my home? Is this where you're calling me to grow deep roots? And if so, then I can devote myself in those areas, but I'm not ready to devote myself in those areas because I'm still questioning. That's good. Question. Come to the membership class. Learn more about who we are, what kind of church we are, our practices, what we do, what we believe. Do those things. And then at the end of the class, you can say, nope, this isn't for me. And we'll be like, you know what? What's your heart? Let's look at it. Hey, I know a church in Birchport that's perfect for you. Just get rooted. Get rooted. People leave Kingdom Life all the time. When they, those that choose to talk to me, a lot of them, you know, they just, like a thief in the night, you know. But the ones that choose, I'm like, listen. <laughs> I was at it. But the ones that, I'm like, okay, let's address why you don't feel you can build deep roots here. And if not here, then where? Because sometimes the issues follow us, right? Sometimes, you know, we can, move to, we can move to sunny Florida, and then we get to sunny Florida, we're like, yo, I miss the snow. Because it had nothing to do with the snow. <laughs> it follows you. Other times, God might be saying, the giftings that I have for you, I'm going to plant you somewhere else. And we then say, okay, let's do it. I know a great pastor I could connect you with here because we're family. We love one another. We want to see us all bearing fruit and thriving. Amen? Stand on up with me. I've run out of time. Lord God, we thank you for this day. Next week, I want to invite you all to invite somebody else to come to Kingdom Life. Next week is our Compassion Sunday. It's going to be amazing. We have Jonathan Almonte coming here from the Dominican Republic. He works for Compassion International, which is an organization that educates, feeds, clothes, builds up the local church, feeds and, and educates children in some of the worst impoverished areas around the world. And we can sponsor children. And we're going to have an opportunity next week to hear from a former 
compassion child who is now the number two man in charge of compassion in the Dominican Republic with an incredible testimony of faith, of love, overcoming and the power of God and what compassion can do and how we can be part of that. The other thing about being part of the church is we want to equip and empower and connect with the bigger C church. And this is one of the ways we do it. So next week, invite friends. This is a great service. Family, you came this week. Come back next week. I'm telling you, you're going to love it. Okay? You're going to love it. And you don't have to sponsor a child. So come regardless. But get ready to be motivated. Get ready to hear about faith and what God is doing in other parts of the world. And with that being said, let's pray. Grab the hand, if you don't mind, of the person next to you. As we are one. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your church. We thank you for Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We thank you how it all comes together. And we can come together to be one to be one with our spouse and our child, to be one with our families and friends, to be together and one as a church, as kingdom life and what you're doing through all these different initiatives and, and ways to build a rhythm and a culture and a way for us to not just stay where we're at but to grow and to mature in you. And how, Lord God, like for next week, to be connected to the Bigger C Church. We thank you for Jonathan and his family that are going to be here next week with us, with his boys and his wife. We thank you for what you've done in his life through poverty and abandonment that you've called him a son. And we thank you that you've called him to come and bless this church next week. So Lord God, we thank you for your church. Regardless of the spots or wrinkles that we see, Lord God, we know that your church that you're coming back for won't have a spot or a wrinkle because of your blood and what you do. So that is the church we believe in. That's the church we speak over. And that's the church we desire to become and to be. Realizing this is who we've always tried to be and who we will always continue to be. Through your Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, We thank you. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Have a great week, families. Me and my wife would love to meet you if you have the time to come on up. Parents of little kids, you can come on up here to take pictures if you want. Uh, Pavan, can you put up the, if you have a screen for the baby dedication? We love you guys. Have a wonderful week.